Welcome, everyone, to the first episode of Teen Talk, a podcast where we get a chance to dive into mental health from the perspective of today's youth. We will be discussing real-life mental health problems and talking about how mental health affects our teens. Each podcast will have teens from our community talking about their mental health and wellness and bringing awareness in an anonymous format, unfiltered and with current issues. Let's get a chance to know each other. First, let me introduce myself. Hi, everyone. I'm Dalen, and I work at Nexus Youth and Family Services in the therapy department. I've worked with children and teens for a long time as an educator and school administrator, now transformed into a beautiful butterfly. I'd like to introduce my lovely co-host with the most, a fellow therapist here at Nexus Youth and Family Services, Jessica Walling. Hey, everyone. I'm Jessica. I also work here at Nexus in the therapy department. I've worked in the healthcare field for over 15 years, and working with mental health is by far my greatest interest. I'm excited to help facilitate today's discussions. Before we get started today, we want to encourage everyone to be aware of their feelings about mental health and to know that the topics we discuss are heavy and can be very triggering for those listening. If the listeners can be conscious of their mental health needs and seek help if needed, this podcast is not meant to be a therapy or advice to the listeners. If you feel you need support, please reach out to Nexus. If we cannot help you, we can find you services and offer referrals to your local area. Our website is www.nexusyfs.org. That's www.nexusyfs.org. And our phone number is 209-257-1980, extension 101. And if you find yourself in a psychiatric emergency, please dial 911. Or the new number for the suicide emergencies is 988. Or you can text 741-741 to reach a counselor. Back to you, Dalen. All right. We have our first guest or victim today. Uh, I mean our wonderful guest, right? (laughs) Uh, We've brought Layla on, which is an alias, and we're keeping our underage clients' actual identities confidential. So, Layla, we are so happy to have you in studio today because we really want to hear about your story and experiences. Happy to be here. All right, Layla, if you can, give us a little bit about yourself. Okay, um, I'm a senior in high school this year and been focusing a lot on all my college stuff. Um, I play sports, a lot of sports to help keep myself busy and I I like to read and draw a lot of the basic teen activities. How old are you, Layla? I'm 17. Okay. And how is school going for you right now? We're on what? Winter break right now? Yeah. Yeah? Uh, Thank God. (laughs) (laughs) Um, School can be a lot. It's pretty stressful, especially mixing in all of the like AP classes, senior year with college applications, scholarship applications and stuff. It's a lot. Contrary to popular belief, being a teen is kind of hard. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. It is. Parents help them with anything, or is this all on, on you? Um, well, I'm technically an unaccompanied youth, so a lot of it is just on me. I do get support from some other family sometimes, um, but when it comes to all the college stuff, they I'm a first generation, so I've had to figure all of it out. To our own. listeners here... You know, some people may not understand what unaccompanied means, so can you describe that a little bit for us? Um, So unaccompanied can mean that you're homeless. It can mean that you're um, emancipated or something, I'm pretty sure. But I, for me, unaccompanied means that I don't live with a parent or legal guardian. Okay. All right. So with that, right, so you do have somewhere that you stay an option that you had for you was to live with family, correct? So I do live with my sister and her family. Okay. So with being an unaccompanied minor and making those decisions and choices, we want to discuss today kind of what mental health looks like for you. Okay? Okay. Um, I think mental health can mean a lot of things, but... Sadly for me, when I think mental health, I just think of, like, the hard parts of it. And I know, like, from just bad experiences that I've had, like, sometimes my mental health is in, like, a rough place. So 
What does that mean, rough place? Rough place. Um, like I struggle with post-traumatic stress disorder and anxiety. So sometimes my mental health can get in the way of my success. Okay. Which is something, you know, I think anyone with, like, mental health struggles knows, like, you have to avidly fight against it all the time. Mm. So when we talk about mental health, okay, you're 17, you're in high school, what does that look like from a teenage perspective? Not necessarily what you understand it to be, but, like, do you think your friends know what mental health means and what that looks like? Um, I think that can be a little hard to define sometimes, like, as someone who, like, has had, I guess, a technically unorthodox childhood. I've had a lot of, um, like, bad experiences or, like, like I said, mental health problems growing up, so it's a little hard sometimes to feel like other teenagers understand me and um yeah I, I forgot the second part of the question it's okay <laughs> so we're discussing kind of what mental health looks like from a teen perspective okay. like with your peers would they understand it you know we know that you've battled with your mental health for a while it's something that it's ongoing like you said it's something that you're constantly working on and you understand what that means but does your friend understand what that means? Does a classmate understand what that means? So up to this point, I have not found like very many other people my age that do understand what that means. Like I have met other people that um, understand what it's like to have anxiety or something. And that always is like, in a weird way, a nice discovery, like to feel like someone kind of understands me but it's been like a hard route trying to find people that can kind of, I don't know, find out things that have happened to me or things I struggle with and not look at me differently. Okay. So let's Acceptance. Say, yeah. So let's say, though, you've got friends, right? And you quickly kind of figure out, like, who I can talk to about this, right? Yeah. Who, how do you... How do you figure that out? Like, how do you know that you can trust somebody with what you want to share with them? Um, I feel like for me, a lot of times it's a feeling pretty instantly on if they are going to be able to like handle certain things. Like if, like I see the way that they react to other situations, um, like any small scale problems, like with someone being upset or sad or something like can they handle that without getting like turned off really fast because I have had friends in the past where like I'm a pretty upbeat like bubbly person like on the daily but when like stuff gets kind of hard like you know I show up to school and I'm just a little bit more quiet reserved and I've had friends in the past before tell me like yeah you're just you're just a downer like I can't be around you and then instantly like we're not friends anymore because they didn't want to be around any other side of me. And so, like, that, for me, that's pretty telling. Like, okay, I can't tell you, like, different things that are going on in my life because you're not going to understand right. or want to understand. Right. So there's this misconception that having mental health and having things going on as a teen is very accepted. But from what we're hearing, it's harder to find someone to communicate with and someone to accept you that's your age. Yeah, or what I've noticed from my experience too is there are different people that will accept it. Like, oh, like I, I'm still going to treat you like a person and or I'm going to say that like, oh, yeah, no, like that, that's okay that you like have this or that. But it has been very hard for me to find people that I feel actually understand um, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or like they can relate. In Relatability a, in to a sort it. Of way. Yeah. Someone that maybe you can talk to about it 
when you're going through it and they accept it versus someone who turns you away. Yeah. Right. Having that that one person. Do you have a person that's your age that you know that if I really need to talk to them, I can I can go to that person? Yeah, I have one friend who he's like pretty good at listening to me. It's it is interesting because he's had a pretty like he's admitted like a pretty well off childhood like and grown up and doesn't struggle with any of the things I struggle with but he's a pretty um, good listener so it's nice having someone to talk to even if I feel like they don't always understand quote unquote like what I'm talking about so I feel like for teens like any any sort of feeling of support from other from peers like can be helpful right so when we were discussing earlier, you had talked about how you've done therapy for a while. It's something that you're not very new to. This is something you've done. But there's a shift and a change from childhood to adolescence to even being a teenager. So with that, you know, what was meant, what was therapy for you at that turning point? Like when you were going as a kid, you've gone for a while, but then you're starting to hit that teenage days where you're wanting a little more independence and life is changing, you're having to become an adult, responsibilities. What does therapy look like for you at that turning point? So I noticed that when I went to therapy when I was younger, it was all because it was like court ordered, because of like family problems and stuff like that. And a lot of times I just, all I remember from going to therapy when I was younger was playing shoots and ladders and Candyland. Like, I don't remember actually talking too much. Um, and I had some good experiences with therapists when I was younger or some less good experiences. But I think the big difference from when I went when I was younger versus now was that I was finally old enough to decide on my own. Like, I want to go back to therapy and work on myself um, and learn how to cope and like get over some of my hardships that might not be like as avid right now in my life. Because when I was younger at the time, I was going because things were happening in the moment. And then now I'm going because I want to heal from things that happened in the past. So we've talked a lot about things that were happening, things that were happening in the moment, things in your past. You think you're ready to tell us a little bit about your story? Sure. All right. It's up to you. Okay. Um, trying to think of like a starting point. I guess we could just go from the beginning. When um, I was only three, my parents split because my dad was pretty physically, emotionally, mentally abusive to my mom. And um, it didn't end very pretty. My mom ended up shooting my dad out of self-defense. And he lived. He went to the hospital and my mom went to prison. (laughs) But she ended up getting released, I think, two years later on account of self-defense. But um, so there was a pretty rough start. But going forward, because my mom was now a convicted felon. I, my dad got full custody of me. And um, so my whole childhood was kind of spent living with him and a different woman, whoever he happened to be dating or married to at that time. And then when that said relationship didn't work out, we were back with my grandma, his mom or I was with an aunt or an uncle or something. It was just pretty inconsistent. I think I've moved over 10 times um, and changed schools every time. And But um, then... So can, can I back up and ask some questions? Yeah. So you said it was... I thought this was interesting. It almost kind of sets the stage for, like, the trauma that you're going through. <laughs> Your mom defended herself. Yeah shot your dad, went to jail for two years. Yeah. It was deemed self-defense, so it took two years to be you know, found out as self-defense. Yeah. 
And she's still labeled as a felon, even though it's self-defense. Yes. I don't think a lot of people know that that happens. Yeah, she and, can't get a regular job. She can't buy a house. Right. There's <clears throat> so many things that she's not allowed to do. So then now you're out. You've got, you're given to your dad full custody. Is mom trying to contact you? Is she like forbidden from seeing you? What does that look like? Yeah, so um, I, I can't speak too much for like the first few years of my life just because my memory can only go back so far. Right. <laughs> but um, most of my childhood, like everything I can remember from ages like five to 12, which is custody battles. My mom was trying super hard to get at least joint custody of me or anything. Um, and as I got older, like when she first got out of prison, um, there was like uh, court ordered like visitations, but we only got to see each other like once every couple months with Child Protective Services present. Like we would go to a park and play for an hour and then that was it, that was all I got. And then um, as I got older, I don't know why this changed, but um, slowly it was like, okay, I could see my mom every other weekend and stay at her house. And then that, that was all it ever got to be, it was like every other weekend and then sometimes during the summer I would get to stay for a week. But yeah, and then the custody battles never ended. Okay. So they never end. Your dad's had multiple girlfriends. You said you moved like 10 times. Yeah. What is, how, what's happening during that time? Like what age range are you with all of this, with all of this movement? Um, ages four through 15. Four to 15. Yeah, it ended at 15 because that's when I... Uh, left his house and started living with like my sister and stuff but like but up to that point we had always moved in with whoever he was dating married to at that time didn't matter um, and sometimes it was only for a year a few months sometimes it was for multiple years um, but like the one consistent thing through every single relationship was the abuse that that it was inevitable. So your dad repeatedly, whoever he was with, would start that cycle again of abuse? Yeah. And what are you thinking during this time? So you're seeing your dad, you know, fall in love or really like somebody, and what does that deterioration look like through your eyes when all of a sudden the relationship goes bad? Um, so I think that for me personally, like one of the most harmful things that I saw was um, like the glimpses of love that were in some of those relationships and then how it can shift so quick into like physically harming someone that you supposedly love and um, and as like a young girl like being so confused on what like love really was or supposed to be because that was the only example I had. I had nothing else to look at. Right. Um, but, just pushing the tissues over here. <laughs> but, something, from a very young age though, I was um, able to recognize a consistent pattern, you know. Many people have heard of the cycle of abuse and that's so accurate. Like, especially like one of the stages that sticks out the most in my mind is like the honeymoon stage which is like after the abuse occurs there is this sort of like honeymoon like you just got married you're in love and because he's trying so hard to like make up for his actions mm -hmm. but there was flowers everywhere there was love and affection being shown Please accept my apology. I promise I won't do this again. Yeah. yeah. And, like, that is one of the most, that for me personally was, like, one of the most harmful things to see because it always got my hopes up or it always made me feel like, well, maybe, maybe it's worth it to, like, go through all the bad to reach this sort of stage because it, it's so um, fooling, like, to the eye. Like, it looks so beautiful, like, the love that you can see. Um, and so the 10-year-old the in you is seeing that. Yeah. But what about the you now? 
how do you feel about that scenario now? Disgusting. Disgusting. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, I have grown a lot, even when I was still living there. I think by the time, or living with him, by the time I reached like 12, I knew, like, because I recognized, oh, it doesn't end there. Like, it always starts up again. And I was almost always able to recognize, like, oh, in about this much time, like, this is going to happen again. Because even, like, the, the said honeymoon stages got shorter and shorter. Because these women don't leave. And then it just, you know, keeps repeating. But... I finally reached a point where I was like, none of this is worth it. <laughs> this right. is not love. Um, and your dad's moving into their homes, so yes. it's hard for them to get rid of him because he's now brought you into their home. Yes. And the thing that was interesting, though, is a lot of times, so he he worked different construction jobs or, like, truck driving and stuff, so he was a lot of times gone far away for jobs for weeks sometimes months and then I was just stuck with these random women to like be my parent Mm. um, for however long when I didn't know and what was the range of their their ability to to parent you where where some of them just like this girl's in my house or when some of them (laughs) actually trying to be like a good mom like what what was the range so there was I've also come to, like, recognize a lot of patterns with my dad just in general. Like, every woman that he found had either been previously married or at least had kids from whatever before relationships. So they all had kids. So I've had many, many step-siblings or soon-to-be (laughs) step-siblings. So, um, but there was, there's been a large range of how I was, like, treated or taken care of by the different women like there were some who were all right for like the couple weeks that I was there um like one of them I remember her taking me to the movies (laughs) like one time and telling me I could get whatever candy I wanted she was all right um but I, I remember with her a lot of time my grandma was there like trying to help take care of me but there's been others that were not that way like that where I was like heavily neglected for like months on end like there was one who I remember like I was always like for context a very quiet kid um I was just a nervous child because of like everything that had been like happening right you're quiet you're trying to stay out of the line of fire please don't notice me I'm not a problem leave me be and I won't cause a problem for you yeah like I'm not just saying that I was a good kid I was not a problem child I like to sit in my bed and read books and avoid the people around me because I didn't want to like be on the other end you know right so um there were like some women that did recognize that and it was interesting because even like they would get into arguments with their kids that were like around my age and I remember one of them in particular like yelling at her daughter why can't you just be like Layla (laughs) and it was so like heartbreaking you know because then that would like cause problems between me and my step siblings Um, but then there were other women who treated me like I was kind of scum (laughs) if that makes sense sure like I remember one of them like she had two sons and then when my dad was away like one night they were watching a movie like on the couch or something and so and she had like bought a bunch of snacks and I go walking out there to like you know join them that we were doing like family movie night <laughs> I was probably just like five at this time and then she like screamed at me and told me to go into my room like I wasn't like her family and I wasn't allowed to be there and she didn't want me there and I was like stuck in this room for I don't even know how long but I just remember crying and like wanting my mom (laughs) and I don't know just wanting like an actual parent but there was a lot of different like situations like that with different women like one of them she would buy 
her kids like a bunch of stuff all the time and then when I like didn't even have shoes that fit and like I just had to constantly like witness that and like I I was pretty young I was probably like seven or eight but I knew like it just, just that constant feeling of being like the least favorite you know right or like the only one like the outsider like oh this is the family and then there's me right and nobody wanted to or like feel like nobody wanted me when you're a kid there's nothing you can do about that you're stuck in that situation yeah that and for people listening to that that's what causes the complex trauma that's what com causes complex PTSD when you're in a neglect um neglectful situation that you can't get out of yeah. over an extended amount of time you know so what what was happening at this time what did any of these women were they abusing you or just being neglectful no yeah they were all just um, not just being neglectful like, that's super hurtful <laughs> no I'm just dividing I'm just trying to I'm just trying to distinguish the types of abuse that you're dealing with. No, I get what you're saying. No, none of them ever physically abused me. Um, some of them were more, like, emotionally abusive than others. Some of them just didn't really, like, care about my existence, but they didn't, like, do anything, like, outwardly wrong to right. me. Okay, uh, they just, like, ignored you? Yeah. Kept you but that's, at an arm's that's distance. that's still outwardly wrong. Yeah. Let, yeah. you know, let's clarify that, that, you know, as someone who's supposed to be that parental and mothering figure in someone's life to just ignore you, yeah. that's still outwardly wrong. And that's still harmful yeah. for a child to live in that cycle. Yeah, I was. So uh, I've got a quick question for you. So dad's gone, you know, doing jobs. Sometimes he's there. But is he, at a certain age, does he start hitting you? Does he start abusing you? Does he bring you into that cycle, or is it just with his girlfriends? No. So he never um, hit me because, I mean, I, I can't really say why. But, like, my, the main reason, I, I think, is because he knew that I would tell people. Like, that, that was the one thing that I've noticed is abnormal about me. Like, that as opposed to, like, a lot of those women or other people I've seen in my type of situations is a lot of them are, like, scared into silence. But um, because I did, in a way, like, have my mom around, she was the only person that, like, I would tell these things to when I would go see her. And she was constantly trying to, like, give me the strength <laughs> sorry sorry it's all right constantly trying to give me the strength to like <laughs> to um talk about what was happening because i i did not want to be there obviously and so i would get heavily punished because there were times when like something extreme would happen and then i would tell a teacher or something because they would notice that I was like I looked neglected or like I was upset for like weeks on end at school and so like they would ask me and um, and I didn't lie and that always like led to CPS coming to our house and different stuff like that um, so but what the constant answer was was that um well if you're not getting hit then we can't do anything about it if the children aren't being hurt there's nothing we can do about it their relationship is totally separate from yours type of thing <coughs> so <coughs> my dad knew that and he didn't want me to go live with my mom or anything no matter how many times like tried and so I think he knew that he was untouchable in the way of like hurting a lot of these women because they wouldn't stand up for themselves. But he had been repeatedly told that if he did, ever did anything to me, there would be consequences. So at some point, you made the decision to not live in that cycle anymore. Mm. I, I had done that since I was like, six I think 
When you turned 15, though, what, what oh. changed? Yeah, how did you get out of it? How did you <clears throat> remove yourself from that? Um, so when I was 15, I was still seeing, like, a different court-ordered therapist at the time. And by this point, like, I had had so many different, like, CPS workers come to our house, and then nothing happened from it. Um, and then I was always, like, punished after that or just living in, like, a really not good situation because they were angry at me um so I kind of reached a point of helplessness of like okay I'm gonna go to therapy but I'm not even gonna do what you're supposed to do at therapy I'm not gonna tell her like this stuff that's gonna because I, I knew like how mandated reporters worked and so I was like I'm I'm done like telling them stuff that's gonna get the police at my house or anything just for it not to work out again so I only told her things that I thought were more surface level, which now I can see like my perception was very skewed because I was telling her like extremely like upsetting things that were happening. I just, they didn't include someone getting punched in front of me. So I was Can like, you give us an example of something that you shared? Yeah. So, um, Actually, the thing that made her call CPS was when I was talking to her, I was saying, or I was telling her that um, with his most recent girlfriend, that they started doing this thing where, like, when they would fight, they would tell me, like, wake me up at, like, 2 in the morning when they are fighting, and then, like, lock me in the bedroom to make me watch, and then, I don't know, like, they wanted my opinion, or, like, someone, I don't, I don't, I really can't tell you why, like, I don't understand it, but, like, and they would just, like, scream at each other, break stuff, and I would just, like, sit there and, like, peel my nail polish off, <laughs> and, like, wait for them to let me leave, because I was, like, super uncomfortable, and, um, and they would be, like, saying just a bunch of, like, out absurd things um to each other and um and it was just scary but I didn't I don't know because my I was just used to such like an extreme like in these abusive relationships that I was like oh that's nothing and so I was telling my therapist this just like offhandedly and then she told me she had to report it <clears throat> And I started like crying and begging her not to, um, because like I was scared of like what the outcome was would be like if there was just another failed CPS visit. <laughs> and um, she told me she had to, and then that it would take probably about ten days before they came. And so I. <laughs> I was really scared, so I wanted to make sure that I could go to my sister's house before that CPS visit and just tell her everything. So I did. I went to my sister's house like that weekend, and I was telling her everything that was going on, and like, I don't know, just how scared I was. And then, so when I went back, they knew because I guess CPS had come while I was gone. And when I got to my, right when I got in the car, they took all my stuff from me. And then I got to my house and it was, my room was like completely gutted. Like all my stuff was gone. Um, even like my pillow <laughs> on my bed. And like that was my quote unquote punishment. Like wasn't even allowed to read books or this was during COVID I wasn't allowed to do school <laughs> online or anything and so and I couldn't get a hold of anyone because I had no devices and so like by this point like what I I wasn't eating or anything like the only thing that I was doing because I had nothing to do sitting in a room like locked in a room alone for days I wasn't allowed to communicate with anyone. They wouldn't let me come out there and like talk to them or my step siblings or anything. 
And so what I was doing was I was like, I was allowed to go to the bathroom, so I'd go to the bathroom and like take all the Midol that we had, just so I could sleep all day and all night. Um, and so like after a few days of this, I was like, okay, I need to leave. <laughs> like I can't keep doing this. So I was planning like to run away and before this, when I knew CPS was going to come, I had started kind of thinking about the possible outcomes, and so I, like, memorized all my different family members, like, that knew, like, I started memorizing their phone numbers, my sisters and stuff, so that I could potentially run away and, like, call for help, um, and so the day that I was planning to leave, CPS came again, because I guess they found out that there was like one person missing from the house when they came um the person who they were there to talk to and so they came back um and we like went downstairs and I, it was like two women and I had to talk to them and um basically my dad and his girlfriend at the time had told me like we're gonna be listening to the whole thing you better not lie and, or because they would constantly tell me I was lying when I would say like that their relationship was abusive um, which was really weird like they used to threaten to send me like to like a mental hospital or something because they said I was crazy and like imagining things and I was like schizophrenic and, <coughs> yeah that's a type of gaslighting yeah and so like a lot of my childhood like included that where like I would watch something happen right in front of me and then be told that it didn't happen and you know by 15 I knew that like it was real and um and I couldn't keep like living like that so I went downstairs to like talk to the CPS women and I basically started the conversation by telling them my dad and his girlfriend are standing right there listening. I know they hear me. Hello. <laughs> and um, and I said, and I know they're going to tell you that, like, I have all these mental disorders that I have never been diagnosed with. Um, you can go through our medicine cabinets. I don't know. Like, but... You know there is abuse in this relationship and there's this this and this and you're gonna tell me that's not enough to take me out of this place but if you don't help me i'll help myself i'm because i'm not staying here like and then um so like for the first time i felt like they took me kind of seriously and so from that point on they listened to everything i had to say for about two hours and then they kind of they filed, I think, what they call is like an open case, um, uh, where it's not like we we're gonna go to court and like battle it out yet. It was just like a, okay, for right now we're gonna put you somewhere else, and then if stuff keeps happening, then it will become a case. And so I told her to call my sister, and I would. They instantly came and picked me up, even though they lived like two hours away. And then in the like file, they said I was only supposed to be there for a month and then come back to my dad's house. But my dad had heard everything I said. And I think he finally, oh, and in, in the papers that they wrote, they said like even if him or his girlfriend like took a drink of alcohol or did, or were like arguing in front of the kids or anything that it would instantly become an, like a case and I think that's why he made a decision to just like okay I'm done then like I'm not gonna give up all these things um, when you say I'm done what do you mean I'm done him or me H him your dad done trying to keep me there because I had tried like my whole life to get away from him and um, I had tried to move in with my grandma at different times, with my sister, my brother, aunts and uncles. Like, that that was like the one 
thing about my childhood that I'm extremely great, grateful for is I did have people that cared about me mm-hmm. and wanted to help me. It just always went unsuccessful because right. he would fight so hard. So what did he say to you to let you know that he was done? He didn't. He just stopped it. He just didn't answer phone calls. He I, Once we reached a month, he didn't try to take me back. So okay. radio um, silence. Yeah, and then his girlfriend eventually called my sister and was like, okay, we made the decision that she can stay there. But when I moved in with my sister, like I had nothing. Because like I said, they had taken everything. I didn't have like different clothes to change into or like a toothbrush or anything. So my sister did like a lot for me, like had to help me replenish a lot of that stuff and kind of just start from scratch. And how much older is your sister from you? Not a lot. She was 23. She was 23 at the time? Yeah. It's a lot for a 23-year-old to take on. Yeah. Was she married? Yeah, she's married, and she has a, um, now she's three, a three-year-old, but at the time she was only one, I think. Yeah, she was one. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, definitely out of their um, realm of knowledge at the time, I think, but it changed my life. Yeah, thank goodness, right? Yeah. <laughs> you want to take a second? You okay? I'm good. You want to check in, make sure you're feeling okay? That's a lot of heavy stuff yeah. to really yeah. unload and to experience at such a young age. Yeah. And it's it's very noticeable, your resilience yeah. and your maturity that's, that's stemmed from that. And do you feel like... Um, part of the side effects of this is you having to grow up a little faster For sure. and what that's that's done to even just your social life yeah I think it's I always say like I'm grateful for everything that I went through because it has like sounds like a cliche but it really has like made me who I am today like obviously the bad parts but I think all the best parts of me also come from this like my my empathy for other people and like um I don't know just like my ability to understand other people I think has come from all of this and then yeah maturity resilience Um, when when you walked in the door I was like wait I thought this was teen talk (laughs) I thought you just carried yourself so much older Oh, she yeah. really does. She's yeah. a very mature soul, and that was one of the things that we wanted to to bring to this is the ability to make that choice. Yeah, to decide I deserve better yeah. after the cycle has gone through for so many years, and and what that looks like at your age mm-hmm. to make that choice, and <clears throat> you know, going through these cycles. <coughs> We're all surviving here at school. <laughs> um, going through all of these these cycles that you've been through and changing schools time and time again and not being able to really build those social relationships. Yeah. You made that decision at, you know, at 15 that you wanted something different and you've been in the same place for about how long now? Two years. Okay. Um, or you mean the same place like where I'm living? Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, two, two years. Um, I think as of March. Do you feel like in that time you've been able to finally try to build those social relationships that you couldn't build at a younger age? Um, I I am trying. That's why I've come back to (laughs) therapy and stuff. But um, it's extremely hard. Like I said, um, like feeling connected to other people my age especially. Um, I think the way, like, the best analysis I have of it is, like, I have lived a lot of life for a 17-year-old, and so I think I have a hard time connecting with other people my age sometimes, or feeling like they, it sounds so, like, weird or, like, cocky in a way, that's not how I mean it, but, like, they haven't lived as much as I've lived, and, like, they don't understand me in a way, um, which isn't always true, but... It's just, like, something that 
it's like an internal flaw, you know, and that it makes it really hard to like make friends sometimes or friendships that last. Cause like I said, I'm pretty friendly, bubbly, and stuff. I can make friends very easily, but I, I have never had a friend that has lasted either because they didn't put in you know they didn't care to keep a friendship after I moved or something or because eventually I gave up on like trying to like reach a certain depth in my friendships because you know there's friends and then there's like best friends that you right. like share stuff and I I just stopped doing that like years ago with my friends do you feel you stopped doing it because they can't relate or because it's, you know, something else going on that you just didn't want to keep fighting for that connectivity? Um, I think, yeah, part of it is because I feel like they can't relate. But then I think a lot of it is, like, I have been left so many times by, like, most of the people in my life like adults and stuff too so it's like made it really hard to put myself out there to like yeah. want to form friendships and like really get a closeness with people that I actually care about because then I get scared to put myself in a situation where like I start something that I'll actually miss if I lose it you know because if I don't let myself get like close enough then if it doesn't work out, then I'm not that hurt. <laughs> yeah, it's that fight or flight kicking in. You're protecting yourself with that. Um, our brains are wired to do that. It's yeah. that we're wired to look for that negativity and protect ourselves from it first. And yeah. so that's something very prevalent and, and common that people don't realize that we do. And so you've gone through this these cycles after cycle after cycle. So... My question to you, we've yeah. talked about friendships and, and you know, having connectivity with people. A common question teens do is they date. Oh. How does that, how do you feel that's affected potential teen dating for you? Um, extremely negatively. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, so I didn't date at all until I was 16. Like, once I was already living here and stuff, um, because up to that point, I, I had only seen, like, bad relationships, and I was like, I don't ever want that. <laughs> like, right. I thought I would never get married or anything like that, um, and I don't know, but then once I reached, like... 16 and I had been living here um I did start dating um and I think every time that I have tried it's like every I don't know why it's like my PTSD just becomes like super prevalent yeah even if they're not doing anything wrong um and I just I get like extremely depressed um or a lot of times it's caused me to go for people that like are not good for me because what does that mean go for guys that aren't good for you um like ones that resemble my dad like, yeah. in different ways without knowing it at first and then like later on seeing it but like in a way, I think it was because I had never gotten, like, the validation that I wanted from my dad. So I started getting it from people like him, and it felt really good until, like, until it wasn't, you know. Um, and I don't know. Like, I know that's a, a common thing that, like, people who grew up being abused or um, like seeing abusive relationships like end up being in them and that's kind of like the path I was going down for a while and then I realized like that's not what I wanted for myself um, and I wanted to be 
smarter than that, I guess. And if, so, if you want, you can, like, turn and give a nice big blow if you want. <laughs> on the <note. laughs> Okay, thank you. But, um, so you wanted something different, and you realized that. Yeah, and because I had been with some not good guys, and then, so I tried to, like, overcorrect by dating people that I just thought were, like, super nice, <laughs> and, like, with some of them, like, there was nothing wrong with them, um, like, they didn't do anything bad to me, I just, like, I, no matter who I was with, I couldn't get over, like, that huge, like, um, I guess, rock of, like, my my PTSD like getting super bad or like just getting really depressed and like or I would start to feel like really just like grossed out by whoever was like I was with even if they didn't do anything wrong like I just it was like you said that fight or flight of like yeah. I can't like this person um yeah. if I actually was starting to care about them so did you find yourself starting to distance yourself from them? Yeah. And, like, I would convince myself that I just did not like them. And so I think after, like, a few failed attempts, like, I finally had a conversation, like, with my sister. And, and I was just crying for, like, hours because I was like, I don't know what's wrong with me. Like, because also, like, one person that I was with told me that, like, I was, I don't know, what, what did I say, something like, I suck the life out of people, or, like, I, I'm draining, because, um, like, I had had something, like, going on at home, like, at the time, but I was just having a hard time, and I don't try to put my problems on other people, I try to just, like, kind of get quiet, close off, and, but he was one of those people that, like, couldn't handle, like, me being anything but happy. And that, like, shut me off for so long. I was just, like, because it just brought back things that my dad had told me when I was younger of, like, that I was worthless and, like, would never be loved and just stuff like that. So, like, I, I started to realize, like, that things that I had gone through when I was younger like are a lot more prevalent in my life now than I thought um and especially like in relationship settings and so now I don't date <laughs> um I made the decision like to not for I don't know how long but until I figure out like different things about myself um, so I don't know, I've been single for like, probably almost a year now, but. Is that one of your goals in therapy? Mm -hmm. What, like to, yeah. Um, well, I'm, I'm picking up that you have a, the sense of being broken with yeah. relationships yes. and that you're, you're really afraid that you're going to pick up traits from your dad and find somebody that's got traits from your dad and you're hearing echoes of the message that your dad was giving you so you're just like forget all this I'm I'm just gonna stay single yeah um which totally works right now but you know down the road yeah I'm not sure just I'm not picking up the vibe that that would be a happy thing for you down the road no that's why like my goal isn't to stay single forever it's that's you don't want to get into the nunnery <laughs> No, I don't know if it's for me. Okay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> like, that's when I, like, after having that conversation was when I decided to come back to therapy. Um, because, like, I know that I'm not broken and stuff. I just have things that I could probably benefit, like, if I healed from a little bit before trying to be in a relationship. Um, so... Yeah, I don't know. I would just like to start trying to heal from my past so that I could set up my future to be more successful. That's super insightful. 
the fact that you even said that out loud is is amazing. <laughs> because uh, I don't hear adults even making that move or even being able to articulate that. So the fact that you're able to articulate that, it's in your mind, and you've made the decision to go to therapy to work on some of these things is really amazing. And I, I just want to thank you for telling us your story because it's a big one. It's like a big <laughs> one. You know, uh, not everybody goes through what you go through. There are going to be some people out there that have. Yeah. And, you know, you sharing this with us, kind of what you've gone through and how it's affecting you now. I mean, only at 17. Guys, we're not talking to a 40-year-old. <laughs> right, <laughs> we're, no. we're talking to a 17-year-old that's already able to articulate I recognizing patterns. Um, I'm closed off. I'm dealing with the anxiety. I see that the, you know, I see the cycle and you're sharing all of that and you're in therapy to get help. Yeah. And that's amazing. So I just want to say thank you for sharing your story. And um, is there any, any words of wisdom that you think would be really good? And I'm going to, I'm going to focus on the ladies out here. <laughs> what would you say to somebody that has been in a similar situation to you, what advice would you give them? The people like in your life that have hurt you or the experiences, the harder experiences that you have faced like are not what define you. That's like something that's been really hard for me to realize like because for so long I let all of this bad stuff define who I was. Like, uh, and now I'm finally getting to a point where I want to find out who I actually am. What do I actually enjoy? Who am I aside from all of this? Um, and so I think that could be beneficial to hear from anyone who has gone through a situation like this. Um, because it's not all that you are. All right. Well, my final note to that is something that we know is posted in my office that I have that I tell all of my clients that our scars that we experience they tell us where we've been but they do not get to dictate where we're going we get to choose our path and I appreciate you coming here today Layla and expressing all of this with us and showing people that you've made that decision to choose your path and you're fighting for yourself thanks for coming in no problem. thanks everybody bye for now <laughs>